Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. Jim, we start with the good and this Story actually came down on Monday afternoon. This was U.S. District Judge Richard Leon in the district court basically saying that the National Security Agency's metadata collection program is probably unconstitutional. We'll get to the probably in a minute. Here's part of what he wrote. I cannot imagine a more indiscriminate and arbitrary invasion than the systematic and high-tech collection and retention of personal data on virtually every citizen for purposes of querying and analyzing it without prior judicial approval. Surely such a program infringes on that degree of privacy that the founders enshrined in the Fourth Amendment. He went on to call the program almost Orwellian. And uh, the reason it's probably unconstitutional is because he's not enforcing the decision, knowing that the Justice Department will appeal it to a higher court. But it's pretty clear that this judge strongly believes that the NSA has gone way too far here, that it violates the Fourth Amendment. And for those of us who have been squeamish about this ever since we learned about it earlier in the year, it's good to know that somebody agrees with that. Yeah. We, you know, ever since we've had the revelations coming from Ed Snowden, there's been this very frustrating quasi-debate. I mean, you know, we in the media have discussed it, and certainly lots of Americans have been kind of unnerved by what they were hearing. I remember having this debate over at the Heritage Foundation, and one of the other panelists kind of felt I was being overly cynical. Go figure. I felt like, you know, congressional oversight had been proven a joke because you have things like James Clapper basically being asked direct questions and then giving answers that are the exact opposite of the truth. And then saying, oh, I misunderstood the question. You have the FISA courts, and then you find out that the FISA courts have approved about 99% of all applications for collecting data from the FBI and, and these other groups since September 11th, and which means that either the FBI is just unbelievably good at their jobs, and they always seem to get the right guys and always come with a uh, fantastic argument, or the FISA courts have kind of turned into a kind of a rubber stamp. You kind of have to look at this and say, hey, if nothing else, the FISA courts are not adversarial. Basically, the FBI goes to a judge and say, we think we should look into this information that, you know, that this person has. There is no equivalent of a defense attorney. There is no uh, person there who's to speak on the person whose information would be rifled through. And so as a result of that, you know, more than 99 times out of 100, the FISA court says, OK, go take a look, see what you find. So finally, from this judge, a non-FISA court, a non-Congress person, we may actually get a little bit of a review. And even if you think this program has helped stop terror attacks, and chances are you're scooping up all this information, chances are, yes, it probably did do some good. Um, it comes at a great cost. And basically the cost is the idea that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution doesn't really mean anything. Because if the government can look into this stuff, it's really kind of, you know, they don't really need to break down the door, right? I mean, they don't really need to look in your car if they can collect all the data from your GPS and your cell phone, know everywhere you're going in places like that. So um, it is a good decision. Hopefully we will have a good, rational, passionate, but, but, you know, clear-headed discussion about the costs and benefits of these types of programs and whether it needs to be reined in. And we won't just rely on Obama's, you know special commission of yes men coming along and saying, well, everything's, you know, pretty good and and the president never knew anything and just get off his back about this, which is basically what, you know, most of his policies have amounted to have amounted to so far. (laughs) On to uh, Martini number two now and Jonathan Carl of ABC News asking Jay Carney a pretty simple question uh, yesterday at the White House briefing. Hey, if folks sign up for their health care policies by December 23rd, will they have coverage as of January 1st as promised? Here was the answer. What I can tell you is that we are working overtime to make sure that every 834 form is accurate when it goes to the issues of the back ends, uh, problems that existed. And I think you've seen a lot of reporting on how that, uh, those back end issues have been addressed and are, continue to be addressed. And then Carl followed up, are you sure people aren't going to fall through the cracks? I can't speculate about what, you know, who may fail to pay his or her premium or what may happen. All I can tell you is what we're doing now to make sure that all of the forms are accurate. Uh, to make sure that everybody is being contacted who may have enrolled and may not be sure that the information got to their uh, issuer. Jim, are you confident after that answer? You know, I will give Jay Carney a few molecules of credit for that answer, which is that for a lot of folks in the administration, the response to these types of problems has been just babble more happy talk and hope that the reporter goes away and say, oh, yeah, yeah. it's going to be fine. You're hunky-dory. We're working out the problems. It's, you know, m- mostly, almost completely, largely, mostly fixed, you know, and and all kinds of qualifiers and stuff like that. 
good for Jay Carney for acknowledging you can sign up for Obamacare between like in the next six days, make your payment or at least think you've made your payment and not actually get insured. Which you know for most you know most people would say that's a disastrous result. That if you if you purchase a product and the product never arrives, you you know go sue somebody, um, or you take them to small claims court. There's no sense of how they're going to fix all these problems with Obamacare. This is, of course, why we should be delaying the individual mandate. This, you know, they've delayed almost every other deadline in, in, involved with Obamacare, and they're basically begging the insurance companies to say, all right, we want people to be insured starting January 1st, so let them pay for it later. And the insurance companies are, are by and large, kind of you know, slack-jawed in response to this. They're being asked to offer insurance for somebody who will pay later with no specification of when they're actually going to pay. Greg, does Radio America provide advertising and tell the advertisers, pay us, pay us when you feel like it? <laughs> that's usually not the policy. And I can tell you that's definitely not how National Review operates with its advertisers. <laughs> that, you know, like, you know, most businesses, you, you get a service, you know, they'll send you a bill, but that, that bill will have a deadline on it. And if you don't, then they might get a increasingly threatening notices and things like that. But for an insurance company, you know, the whole point of this and the idea of the, you know, uh, the reason they had the whole pre-existing conditions, the rules in their, in their plans was because... The idea is, you know, you, you wouldn't have insurance. You get hit by a bus or, God forbid, you get diagnosed with some dread disease. And you then say, okay, well, now I'm going to buy health insurance, right? And, then, of course, that's when you need it. And, of course, you haven't paid for it. So the first month you sign on, you've got these massive, massive costs that the insurance company will never – no matter what you pay in premiums for the rest of your life, the insurance company is still going to lose money on it. So their idea is, no, we want you buying up before you get the condition. And then hopefully we'll be able to, you know, operate some sort of profit and continue to be in existence. Carney's answer, like I said, it, it's an honest one, but I think it illustrates the problems that are going on here. And the NSA story is a very big deal, but this really like the front should be front page news. White House cannot assure that if you buy insurance, you'll get insurance. That's about as big a failure as you can admit. And everybody just kind of shrugged their shoulders at it, it seemed. And his comment that things have vastly improved on the insurance companies getting the information front, that is somewhat news to me. I don't know that there's been massive yeah. leaps and bounds there, but uh, well, that's okay. his contention. So anyway. Sibelius and HHS have been saying it, but the insurance companies are saying, actually, no. <laughs> We're still getting very bad data. It's all coming out garbled. We've got parents listed as dependents of minor children. Some people are coming through just fine, and you'll be able to find the occasional Obamacare success story. But, uh, you know, look, Obamacare will end up helping dozens and dozens of people while <laughs> inconveniencing and lousing up the lives of <laughs> millions and millions of Americans. On to uh, the crazy martini now. I thought the South African translator guy had the crazy martini locked up for the year, but this is a good one. The EPA's highest paid employee, this is from NBC News, and a leading expert on climate change deserves to go to prison for at least 30 months for lying to his bosses and saying he was a CIA spy working in Pakistan so he could avoid doing his real job, according to federal prosecutors. John C. Beale, who pled guilty in September to bilking the government out of nearly $1 million in salary and other benefits over a decade, will be sentenced in a Washington, D.C. federal court on Wednesday. In a newly filed sentencing memo, prosecutors said his lies were a crime of massive proportion and offensive to those who actually do dangerous work for the CIA. He had the highest salary at EPA, even more than the, the EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy. He perpetrated his fraud by largely failing to show up at the EPA for months at a time, including one 18-month stretch starting in June 2011 when he did absolutely no work. To explain his long absences, Beale told agency officials, including Gina McCarthy, that he was engaged in intelligence work for the CIA, either at agency headquarters or in Pakistan. At one point, he claimed to be urgently needed in Pakistan because the Taliban was torturing his CIA replacement. In fact, Beale had no relationship with the CIA at all. Beale didn't even have a security clearance. He spent much of his time, he was purportedly working at the CIA, at his Northern Virginia home, riding bikes, doing housework, and reading books, or at a vacation house on Cape Cod. According to the government investigator, he's never been to Langley. The CIA has no record of him ever walking through the door. Jim? It's a probably in the all-time history of, of you know, useless government bureaucrats and wasteful employees. You know, this is the poster boy for all that is wrong with the entire federal workforce. And... Uh, in addition to whatever prison time he gets, in addition to whatever fines he gets, he really deserves to be pelted with rotten fruit everywhere he goes. And one of the things that actually kind of jumped out at me in this story is, yeah, I'm glad they're throwing the book at this guy, Beale. Greg, are there any consequences for Beale's bosses at the EPA? Oh, of course not. They're victims. Yeah, the, you know, the whole idea of, oh, my goodness, he lied to his employer. Well, first of all, Greg, I won't be able to do the three martini lunch uh, tomorrow. I've, I've got a secret mission in Pakistan I need to get to, you know. <laughs> We haven't seen a picture of this guy, Beale, so maybe he's built like, you know, some tough Navy SEAL type. But I'm, 
I'm guessing he's not. And the idea that, you know, this is the guy who, oh, well, okay, where's he? Oh, he's in Pakistan. You know, like the idea that some, for some reason everyone seems very credulous over there. Um, <laughs> the stretch where he does no work for a year and a half. You know, if the site doesn't get updated in a day, I have Rich Lowry breathing down my neck. You know, <laughs> the idea that you could not work for a year and a half and nobody notices is a pretty glaring sign. And then the next thing, you try the excuse of, you know, I can't come in today, I can't come in tomorrow, or anytime in the near future because I'm on a secret CIA mission. Oh, by the way, you have to keep paying me. At some point, didn't the EPA say, you know, if you're out doing all this work, uh, you know, rescuing guys getting tortured from – by Al Qaeda and stuff, can't they pay you? You know, at least they give us the money to, to, to launder through us, so it looks like you're getting paid. Like, why? Why do you need our paychecks then? To continue, no, it's got to keep my cover identity. Okay, but why is our our climate change expert going off to the the Hindu Kush and off to Taliban lands and all that stuff? So then the next thing is, yeah, but look, great. This is the highest paid employee at the EPA. Can you imagine any other organization? The highest paid employee leaves for long stretches. Nobody knows where he is. And then, oh, by the way, like for a year and a half, he does no work and nobody notices. I mean, this is the sort of thing you make you say, evacuate the EPA building, fire everyone, demolish the building, salt the earth. And never Because as much as, you know, I like clean water and clean rivers, something like that, if this kind of epic level incompetence and malfeasance and ridiculousness can go on for such a long period of time, who investigates a toxic culture at the EPA? Because really, I mean, you know, how, what, what kind of accountability in there, you know, I, I'm not always the biggest fan of Donald Trump, but Greg, put him in there and just have him start firing people left and right. <laughs> just to, you know, light a fire under some of these folks. So in the long history – okay, so I've now been cleared by the publisher to talk about this. Greg, you may have heard me mention I have a book coming out next year. It comes out in June. It's called The Weed Agency. It's a satire of government bureaucracy. It's a novel, and um, I really wish I hadn't finished writing it because this would fit in very well <laughs> in the genre and the style that I'm writing about. Although, it might, although here's the thing. If this was in a novel, you just wouldn't believe it, would you, Greg? <laughs> Probably not. All right. So, so I, I'm realistic in my uh, fictional stories of, of government malfeasance. Awesome. Well, we can't wait for the book to come out in, in June. Some people might think, though, this is only the second greatest fraud that he perpetrated because his real job was to promote the real existence of climate change. So Ace of Spades had a fantastic headline for this. He says, unsurprising, EPA climate change expert caught in fraud. Surprising, <laughs> it's not about climate change. <laughs> this is government bureaucracy here, because this isn't just a guy who was here during the Obama administration. It, it covers uh, all administrations. And, uh, yeah, don't blame this on Obama. Blame this on the civil service. <laughs> yes. Jim, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please join us again on Wednesday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Mm -hmm.